The Continued Story of Taryn, the Assistant Pig Keeper. I'm glad you stayed to listen. Now sit round as Papa Bear reads the story. Chapter 5 The Broken Sword. Gurji ran off, yelping in terror. Gwydion was at Taryn's side as the first rider bore down on them. With a quick gesture, Gwydion thrust a hand into his jacket and pulled out the net of grass. Suddenly, the withered wisps grew larger, longer, shimmering and crackling, nearly blinding Terran with streaks of liquid flame. The rider raised his sword. With a shout, Gwydion hurled the dazzling mesh into the warrior's face. Shrieking, the rider dropped his sword and grappled the air. He tumbled from his saddle while the mesh spread over his whole body and clung to him like an enormous spiderweb. Gwydion dragged the stupefied Terran to an ash tree, and from his belt drew the hunting knife, which he thrust into Terran's hands. This is the only weapon I can spare, he cried. Use it as well as you can. His back to the tree, Gwydion faced the four remaining warriors. The great sword swung a glittering arc. The flashing blade sang over Gwydion's head. The attackers drove against them. One horse reared. For Terran, there was only a vision of hooves plunging at his face. The rider chopped viciously at Terran's head, swung around and struck again. Blindly, Terran lashed out with his knife. Shouting in rage and pain, the rider clutched his leg and wheeled the horse away. There was no sign of Gurji, but a white streak sped across the field. Melingar now had entered the fray, her golden mane tossing. The white mare whinnied fearsomely and flung herself among the riders. Her muddy flanks dashed against them, crowding, pressing, while the steeds of the war party rolled their eyes in panic. One warrior jerked frantically at his reins to turn his mount away. The animal sank to its haunches. Melingar reared to her full height, her forelegs churning the air, her sharp hooves slashing at the rider who fell heavily to earth. Melingar spun about, the trampling, the cowering horsemen. The three mounted warriors forced their way past the frenzied mare. At the ash tree, Gwydion's blade rang and clashed among the leaves. His legs were as though planted in the earth. The shock of the galloping riders could not dislodge him. His eyes shone with a terrible light. Hold your ground, but a little while, he crawled to Terran. The sword whistled. One rider gave a choking cry. The other two did not press the attack, but hung back for a moment. Hoofbeats pounded over the meadow. Even as the attackers had begun to withdraw, two more riders galloped forward. They reined their horses sharply, dismounted without any hesitation, and ran swiftly toward Gwydion. Their faces were pallid, their eyes like stones. Heavy bands of bronze circled their waists, and from these belts hung the black thongs of whips. Knobs of bronze studded their breastplates. They did not bear shield or helmet. Their mouths were frozen in the hideous grin of death. Gwydion's sword flashed up once more. Fly! he cried to Terran. These are the cauldron born. Take Melangar and ride from here. Terran sat himself more firmly against the ash tree and raised his knife. In another instant, the cauldron born were upon them. For Terran, the horror beating in him like black wings came not from the livid creatures, from their livid faces, or their lightless eyes, but from their ghostly silence. The mute men swung their swords, metal grated against metal. The relentless warriors struck and struck again. Gwydion's blade leaped past one opponent's guard and drove deep into his heart. The pale warrior made no outcry. No blood followed as Gwydion ripped the weapon free. The cauldron-born shook himself once, without a grimace, and moved again to the attack. Gwydion stood as a wolf at bay his green eyes glittering, his teeth bared. The swords of the cauldron-born beat against his guard. Terran thrust at one of the livid warriors. A sword point ripped his arm and sent him the small knife hurtling into the bracken. Blood streaked Gwydion's face, where an unlucky blow had slashed his cheekbone and forehead. Once, his blade faltered and a cauldron-born thrust at his breast. Gwydion turned, taking the sword point in his side. The pale warriors doubled their assault. The great shaggy head bowed wearily as Gwydion stumbled forward. With a mighty cry, he lunged, then dropped to one knee. With his flagging strength, he fought to raise the blade again. The cauldron-born flung aside their weapons, seized him, threw him to the ground, and quickly bound him. Now the other two warriors approached. One grasped Terran by the throat, and the other tied his hands behind him. Terran was dragged to Melangar, and thrown across her back, where he lay side by side with Gwydion. 
Are you badly hurt? asked Gwydion, striving to raise his head. No, Terran said, but your own wound is grave. It is not the wound that pains me, said Gwydion with a bitter smile. I have taken worse and lived. Why did you not flee as I ordered? I knew I was powerless against the cultured born, but I could have held the ground for you. Yet you fought well enough, Terran of Caradalbin. You are more than a war leader, Terran whispered. Why do you keep the truth from me? I remember the net of grass you wove before we crossed Avrin, but in your hands today it was no grass I have ever seen. I am what I told you. The wisp of grass, yes, it is a little more than that. Dalbin himself taught me to use it. You too are an enchanter? I have certain skills. Alas, they are not great enough to defend myself against the powers of Oron today. Today, he added, they were not enough to protect a brave companion. One of the cauldron born spurred his horse alongside Melangar, snatching the whip from his belt. He lashed brutally at the captives. Say no more, Gwydion whispered. You will only bring yourself pain. If we should not meet again, farewell. The party rode long without a halt, fording the shallow river Eastrad. The cauldron born pressed tightly on either side of the captives. Terran dared once again to speak to Gwydion, but the lash cut his words short. Terran's throat was parched. Waves of dizziness threatened to drown him. He could not be sure how long they had ridden, for he lapsed often into feverish dreams. The sun was still high, and he was dimly aware of a hill with a tall, gray fortress looming at its crest. Melangar's hooves rang on stones as a courtyard opened before him. Rough hands pulled him from Melangar's back and drove him, stumbling down an arching corridor. Gwydion was half dragged, half carried before him. Terran tried to catch up with his companion, but the lash of the cauldron-born beat him to his knees. A guard hauled him upright again and kicked him forward. At length, the captives were led into a spacious council chamber. Torches flickered from the walls, hung with scarlet tapestries. Outside, it had been full daylight. Here, in the great windowless hall, the chill and dampness of night rose from the cold flagstones like mist. At the far end of the hall, on a throne carved of black wood, sat a woman. Her long hair glittered silver in the torchlight. Her face was young and beautiful. Her pale skin seemed paler still above her crimson robe. Jeweled necklaces hung on her throat. Gem-studded bracelets circled her wrists, and heavy rings threw back the flickering torches. Gwydion's sword lay at her feet. The woman rose quickly. What shame to my household is this? she cried at the warriors. The wounds of these men are fresh and untended. Someone shall answer for this neglect. She stopped in front of Terran. And this lad can barely keep his feet. She clapped her hands. Bring food and wine, and medicine for their injuries. She turned again to Terran. Poor boy, she said with a pitying smile. There has been grievous mischief done today. She touched his wound with a soft, pale hand. At the pressure of her fingers, a comforting warmth filled Terran's aching body. Instead of pain, a delicious sensation of repose came over him. Repose as he remembered it from days long forgotten in Caradalvin, the warm bed of his childhood, drowsy summer afternoons. How do you come here? she asked quietly. We, uh, we crossed Great Avrin, Terran began. You see, what, um, what happened was, uh, silence! Gwydion's voice rang out. She is Akron, she set a trap for you! Terran gasped. For an instant, he could not believe such beauty concealed the evil of which he had been warned. Had Gwydion mistaken her? Nevertheless, he shut his lips tightly. The woman, in surprise, turned to Gwydion. This is not courtesy to accuse me thus. Your wound excuses your conduct, but there is no need for anger. Who are you? Why do you... Gwydion's eyes flashed. You know me as well as I know you, Akron. He spat the name through his bleeding lips. I have heard Lord Gwydion was traveling in my realm. Beyond that... Oron sent his warriors to slay us, cried Gwydion, and here they stand in your council hall. Do you say that you know nothing more? Oron sent warriors to find you, not slay you, answered Akron, or you would not be alive at this moment. Now that I see your face, she said, her eyes on Gwydion, I am glad such a man is not bleeding out his life in a ditch, for there is much we have to discuss, and much that you can profit from. If you would treat with me, said Gwydion, unbind me and return my sword. You make demands, Akron asked gently. 
Perhaps you do not understand. I offer you something you cannot have, even if I loosened your hands and gave back your weapon. By that, Lord Gwydion, I mean your life. In exchange for what? I had thought to bargain with another life, said Akron, glancing at Terran. But I see he is no of no consequence, alive or dead. No, she said. There are other, pleasanter ways to bargain. You don't know me as well as you think, Gwydion. There is no future for you beyond these gates. Here, I can promise. Your promises reek of a Nuvin, cried Gwydion. I scorn them. It is no secret what you are. Akron's face turned livid. Hissing, she struck at Gwydion, and her blood red nails raked his cheek. Akron unsheathed Gwydion's sword. Holding it in both hands, she drove the point towards his throat, stopping only a hair's breadth from it. Gwydion stood proudly, his eyes blazing. No, cried Akron. I will not slay you. You shall come to wish I had and beg the mercy of a sword. You scorn my promises? This promise will be kept. Akron raised the sword above her head and smote with all her force against the stone pillar. The sparks flashed. The blade rang unbroken. With a scream of rage, she dashed the weapon to the ground. The sword shone, still undamaged. Akron seized it again, gripping the sharp blade itself into her, until her hands ran scarlet. Her eyes rolled back into her head. Her lips moved and twisted. A thunderclap filled the hall. A light burst like a crimson sun, and the broken weapon fell in pieces to the ground. So shall I break you! Akron shrieked. She raised her hand to the cauldron horn and called out in a strange, harsh language. The pale warriors strode forward and dragged Terran and Gwydion from the hall. In a dark passageway of stone, Terran struggled with his captors, fighting to reach Gwydion's side. One of the cauldronborn brought a whip handle down on Terran's head. Chapter 6 Elenwy Terran came to his senses on a pile of dirty straw, which smelled as though Gurgi and all of his ancestors had slept on it. A few feet above him, pale yellow sunlight shone through a grating. The feeble beam ended abruptly on a wall of rough damp stone. The shadows of Vars lay across the tiny patch of light. Instead of brightening the cell, the one rays made it appear only more grim and closed in. As Terran's eyes grew accustomed to this yellow light, he made out a heavy studded portal with a slot at the base. The cell itself was not over three paces square. His head ached. Since his hands were still bound behind him, he could do no more than guess at the large and throbbing lump. What had happened to Gwydion, he dared not imagine. After the cauldron warrior had struck him, Terran had regained consciousness only a few moments before slipping once again into whirling darkness. In that brief time, he vaguely remembered opening his eyes and finding himself slung over a guard's back. His confused recollection included a dim corridor with doors on either side. Gwydion had called out to him once, or so Terran believed. He could not recall his friend's words. Perhaps even that had been part of the nightmare. He supposed Gwydion had been cast in another dungeon. Terran fervently hoped so. He could not shake off the memory of Akron's livid face and horrible screaming, and he, she feared that, he feared that she might have ordered Gwydion slain. Still, there was good reason to hope his companion lived. Akron could easily have cut his throat as he braved her in the council hall. Yet she had held back. Thus, she intended to keep Gwydion alive. Perhaps, Terran thought wretchedly, Gwydion would be better off dead. The idea of a proud figure lying a broken corpse filled Terran with grief that quickly turned to rage. He staggered to his feet, lurched at the door, and kicked it, battering himself against it with what level strength remained to him. In despair, he sank to the ground again, his head pressed against the unyielding oaken planks. He rose again after a few moments and kicked at the walls. If Gwydion were by chance in an adjoining cell, Terran hoped he would hear the signal, but he judged from the dull and muffled sound that the walls were far too thick for his feeble tapping to penetrate. As he turned away, a flashing object fell from the, through the grating and dropped to the stone floor. Terran stooped. It was a ball of what seemed to be gold. Perplexed, he looked upward. From the grating, a pair of intensely blue eyes looked back at him. Please, said a girl's voice, light and musical, my name is Elmley, and if you don't mind, would you throw my bauble to me? I don't want you to think I'm a baby, playing with a silly bauble, because I'm not. 
but sometimes there's absolutely nothing else to do around here, and it slipped out of my hands when I was tossing it. Little girl, Tyrion interrupted. I don't... But I'm not a little girl, Elmy protested. Haven't I just finished telling you? Are you slow-witted? I'm so sorry for you. It's terrible to be dull and stupid. What's your name? She went on. It makes me feel funny not know knowing someone's name. Wrong-footed, you know, as if I had three thumbs on one hand, if you see what I mean. It's clumsy. I am Taryn, of Garadalbin, Taryn said, then wished he had not. This, he realized, could be another trap. That's lovely, Ellen we said gaily. I'm very glad to meet you. I suppose you're a lord, or a warrior, or a war leader, or a bard, or a monster. Though we haven't had any monsters for a long time. I am none of those said Taryn, feeling quite flattered that Ellery should have taken him for any of them. Well, what else is there? I am an assistant pig keeper, Taryn said. He bit his lips. As soon as the words were out, then to excuse his loose tongue, he told himself it could do no harm for the girl to know that much. How fascinating, Ellery said. You're the first we've ever had, unless that poor fellow in the other dungeon is one, too. Tell me of him, Taryn said quickly. Is he alive? Well, I don't know, said Eleni. I peeked through the grating, but I couldn't tell. He doesn't move at all, but I should imagine he is alive. Otherwise, Akron would have fed him to the ravens. Now, please, if you don't mind, it's right at your feet. I can't pick up your bauble, Taryn said, because my hands are tied. The blue eyes looked surprised. Oh, well, that would account for it. Then I suppose I shall have to come in and get it. You can't come in and get it, said Taryn wearily. Don't you see I'm locked up here? Well, of course I do, said Eleni. What would be the point of having someone in a dungeon if they weren't really locked up? Really, Taryn of Gerdalvin, you surprise me with some of your remarks. I don't mean to hurt your feelings by asking, but is assistant pig-keeping the kind of work that calls for a great deal of intelligence? Something beyond the grating and out of Taryn's vision swooped down and the blue eyes disappeared suddenly. Taryn heard what he took to be a scuffle, then a high-pitched little shriek, followed by a larger shriek and a moment or two of loud smacking. The blue eyes did not reappear. Terran flung himself back on the straw. After a time, in the dreadful silence and loneliness of the tiny cell, he began suddenly to wish Ellen Wee would come back. She was the most confusing person he had ever met, surely as wicked as everyone else in the castle, although he could not quite bring himself to believe it, believe it completely. Nevertheless, he longed for the sound of another voice, even Ellen Wee's prattling. The grating above his head darkened, Night poured into the cell in a black, chilly wave. The shot slot in the heavy portal rattled open. Terran heard someone being slid, something being slid into the cell and crawled towards it. It was a shallow bowl. He sniffed carefully, and finally ventured to touch his tongue to it, fearing all the while that it might be poisoned food. It was not food at all, but only a little war water, warm and musty. His throat was so parched that Terran disregarded the taste, thrust his face into the bowl, and drank it dry. He curled up and tried to sleep away his pain. The tight thongs pinched, but his swollen hands were mercifully numb. Sleep brought only nightmares, and he roused to find himself shouting aloud. He settled down once more. Now there was a rasping sound other than the straw. Terran stumbled, stumbled to his feet. The rasping grew louder. Move away! cried a faint voice. Terran looked around him, dumbfounded. Get off the stone! He stepped backward. The voice was coming from under the straw. I can't lift it with you standing on it, you silly assistant pig keeper, the muffled voice complained. Frightened and puzzled, Terran jumped to the wall. The pallet began rising upward. A loose flagstone was lifted, pushed aside, and a slender shadow emerged, as if from the ground itself. Who are you? Terran shouted. Well, who do you expect? said the voice of Eleni. And please don't make such a kid. I told you I was coming back. Ah, there's my bauble. The shadow bent and picked up the luminous ball. Where are you? cried Taren. I can see nothing. Is that what's bothering you? Eleni asked. Why didn't you say so in the first place? Instantly, a bright light filled the cell. It came from the golden sphere in the girl's hand. Taren blinked with amazement. What's that? he cried. It's my bauble, said Eleni. How many times do I have to tell you? But, but it lights up. Well, what did you think it was going to do? Turn into a bird and fly away? Eleni, as the bewildered Terran saw her for the first time, had, in addition to blue eyes, long hair, and reddish gold, of reddish gold reaching to her waist. Her face, though smudged, was delicate, 
elfin with high cheekbones. Her short white robe, mud-stained, was girdled with silver links. A crescent moon of silver hung from a fine chain around her neck. She was one or two years younger than he, but fully as tall. Helene put the glowing spear on the floor, went quickly to Terran, and unknotted the thongs that bound him. I meant to come back sooner, Helene said, but Akron caught me talking to you. She started to give me a whipping. I bit her. Then she locked me in one of the chambers, deep underground. Helene went on, pointing to the flagstones. There are hundreds of them under Spiral Castle, all kinds of galleries and little passages, like a honeycomb. Akron didn't build them. This castle, they say, once belonged to a great king. She thinks she knows all the passageways, but she doesn't. She hasn't been in half of them. Can you imagine Akron going through a tunnel? She's older than she looks, you know. Eleanor giggled. But I know every one of them, and most of them connect with each other. It took me longer in the dark, though, because I didn't have my bauble. You mean you live in this terrible place? Taryn asked. Naturally, Eleanor said. You don't imagine I want to visit here, do you? Is... is Akron your mother? Taryn gasped and drew back fearfully. Certainly not, cried the girl. I am Elamly, daughter of Andrad, daughter of Regan, daughter of... Oh, it's a bother going through all that. My ancestors, she said proudly, are the Sea People. I am of the blood of Lyr, half-speech, and the Sea King. Akron is my aunt, though sometimes I don't think she's really my aunt at all. Then what are you doing here? I said I live here, Elamly answered. It must take a lot of explaining before you understand anything. My parents died, and my kinsmen sent me here, so Akron could teach me to be an enchantress. It's a family tradition. Don't you see? The boys are war leaders, and the girls are enchantresses. Akron is leagued with Auron of Anuvin, cried Terran. She is an evil, loathsome creature. Oh, everybody knows that, said Elmi. Sometimes I wish my kinsmen had sent me to someone else. But I think they must have forgotten about me by now. She noticed the deep slash on his arm. Where did you get that? she asked. I don't think you know much about fighting if you let yourself get knocked about and cut up so badly, but I don't imagine assistant pig keepers are often called on to do that sort of thing. The girl tore a strip from the hem of her robe and began binding Terran's wound. I didn't let myself get caught up, Terran said it angrily. That's our aunt's doing, or your aunt's. I don't know which, and I don't care. One is no better than the other. I hate Akron, Eleni burst out. She is a mean, spiteful person. Of all the people who come here, you're the only one who's the least bit agreeable to talk to, and she had you damaged. That's not the end of it, Taryn said. She means to kill my friend. If she does that, said Elmi, I'm sure she'll include you. Akron doesn't do anything by halves. It would be a shame if you were killed. I should be very sorry. I know, I wouldn't like it to happen to me. Elmi, listen, Taryn interrupted. If there are tunnels and passages under the castle, can you get to the other cell cells? Is there a way outside? Well, of course there is, Elmi said. If there's a way in, there has to be a way out, doesn't there? Will you help us? Taran asked. It is important for us to be free of this place. Will you show us the passage? Let you escape? Elmi giggled. Wouldn't Akron be furious at that? She tossed her head. It would serve her right for whipping me and trying to lock me up. Yes, yes, she went on, her eyes dancing. That's a wonderful idea. I would love to see her face when she comes down to find you. Yes, that would be more fun than anything I could think of. Can you imagine? Listen carefully, Terran said. Is there a way you can take me to my companion? Eleni shook her head. That would be very hard to do. You see, some of the galleries connect with the ones leading to the other cells, but when you try to go across, what happens is you start to run into passages that... Never mind, then, Terran said. Can I join him in one of the passageways? Well, I don't want to see why you want to do that, said the girl. It would be so much simpler if I just go and let him out and have him wait for you beyond the castle. I don't understand why you want to complicate things. It's bad enough for two people crawling about, but with three, you can imagine what that would be. And you can't possibly find your way by yourself. Very well, very well, Terrence said impatiently. Free my companion first. I only hope he is well enough to move. If he isn't, then you must come tell me right away, and I'll think of some means of carrying him. And there is a white horse, Melangar, Taryn went on. I don't know what's been done toward her. She would be in the stable, Ellen we said. Isn't that where you'd usually find a horse? Please, Taryn said, you must get her. And weapons for us, will you do that? Ellen we nodded quickly. Yes, this should be very exciting.
She giggled again. She picked up the glowing ball, cupped it in her hands, and once again the cell was dark. The stone grated shut, and only Eleanor's silvery laugh lingered behind. Taryn paced back and forth. For the first time, he felt some hope, though he wondered how much he held, could count on this scatterbrained girl. She was likely to forget what she started out to do. Worse, she might betray him to Akron. It might be another trap, a new torment that promised him freedom, only to snatch it away. But even so, Taryn decided they could be no worse off. To save his energy, he lay down on the straw and tried to relax. His bandaged arm no longer pained him, and while he was still hungry and thirsty, the water he had drunk had taken some of the edge from his discomfort. He had no idea how long it would take to travel through the underground galleries, but as time passed, he grew more anxious. He worked at the flagstone the girl had used. It would not move, though Taryn's efforts bloodied his fingers. He sank again into dark, endless waiting. Elenui did not return. This concludes Chapter 6 of Terran's Adventures. Thank you for listening, and remember, have a good day. You deserve it.